Okay, so for those of you that uh, joined us here earlier, welcome back. And uh, for those of you that are uh, rolling in, welcome uh, to uh, today's webinar, which is called uh, Increasing the Strength and Reliability of Press Fits, given by uh, Henkel Loctite. Um, I am, uh, my name is Miles Budimir. I'm an uh, editor with uh, Design World Magazine. I will be the moderator for today. Uh, but uh, before we begin, a couple of points here to share with everyone. Uh, this webinar uh, will be uh, available afterwards, after the webinar, uh, at designworldonline.com. And also everybody who is registered for the webinar will get a copy of the presentation via email uh, as well. Um, save some time at the end of the webinar for a Q&A that uh, we will have. So if you have questions uh, at all, if they pop up, uh, during any time in the, in the webinar, just feel free to type in your, your question there in the question box, and we will do our best to, uh, to get to every question that we can. We can't promise we'll get to everyone, but uh, we will do uh, our best to get to as many as we can. Uh, and then lastly, uh, if you're on Twitter, and if you'd like to uh, tweet about this webinar in real time, the hashtag for the webinar is hashtag DWWebinar. Well, you can also uh, participate in that way as well. Uh, so, um, as I mentioned before, my name is Miles Budimir. I'm the, uh, the, or a, I should say, senior editor at uh, Design World Magazine. Uh, we have uh, our um, presenter today, and uh, his name is Doug Les Carbo. And I'll uh, tell you um, a little bit about Doug. Doug is the uh, North American Director of Technology Management for uh, anaerobic products for uh, Henkel Loctite. And he works in the Rocky Hill, uh, Connecticut plant at Henkel's North American headquarters. He has a BS in chemistry from the University of Hartford at uh, Connecticut and a uh, MBA degree from Loyola College in Baltimore. So during his 34-year career at Henkel, he's worked uh, with Loctite brand products in R&D, technical services, sales, and marketing. Uh, currently in his role as the uh, anaerobic technology manager, he's responsible for defining the roadmap map for product development and advancement in anaerobic technology, including thread lock, thread sealing, retaining, and gas uh, gasketing products as well. The roadmap is developed uh, based on customer needs, mapping collected through voice of customer interviews with market leading companies, custom product development, and the uh, applied technology breakthroughs. So Doug will be our um, presenter today, and also joining us uh, during the uh, Q&A part will be uh, Rob Dunkel, and uh, a little bit of background on Rob. Uh, Rob is a uh, professional um, engineer with a uh, CMRP uh, certification as well, and he's the Director of Local Services and Facilities for Henkel Canada in uh, Mississauga, uh, Ontario. He's a graduate of the Manufacturing Engineering Program at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. And during his 24-year tenure at Loctite, he's worked on a variety of applications. Um, uh, he's a manager of incoming Loctite industrial technical calls, uh, staff of nine people in the U.S. and Canada, to answer up to 200 to 300 calls per day. And he also manages uh, engineers in Canada focused on working with customers to design uh, to design in, that is, Loctite and Henkel products. So uh, that is a little bit about our um, uh, presenters from Henkel Loctite. And I think uh, without any further uh, pause here, I think I'm going to turn it over to Doug. And um, Doug, it's uh, the, the show is yours. All right. Well, great. Thank you very much, Miles. I appreciate that introduction. Yeah, let's get let's get started with this. I mean, people dialed in so they could learn some more about retaining, and let me get going with that. Uh, so the agenda for today's session is to talk about um, some technology that's available to engineers um, for mechanical retaining applications. And um, what we're going to be talking about are traditional mechanical retaining, kind of set the stage. Then we'll talk about retaining compounds, which is a type of uh, chemistry that is um, suitable for retaining cylindrical parts together. We'll go on some advancements of the technology and then uh, give some specific applications where the products are used. The real goal out of today's session, though, is um, to introduce the audience to uh, a technology and a capability that's out there, probably something they you know, weren't taught in their engineering classes, and hopefully will be of use for them as they're trying to push the envelope. And when they push the envelope, it could be to make 
um, the devices they're producing lighter, stronger, more reliable. Maybe their their goal is to reduce the cost. And this is a, a type of technology that can come in handy for any one of those. And we'll try to give some specific examples as we go through. Uh, in addition, anybody who participates in this session will receive the guide that's illustrated on the right, which was uh, just published um, this this month, as a matter of fact, the new one, which is a, a retaining compound design guide. And um, it provides some background on these materials and how they're used and how they can be engineered in. All right. So let me go to the next slide here. So to start out then, we're going to begin with the basics, really, of uh, traditional retaining techniques. Not that they're um, really to set the stage for comparison. I think it makes it easier when you're introducing a concept to compare it to what people are familiar with. So in this case here, we really three types of uh, retaining mechanical retaining methods we're going to compare to. One of them is going to be the one on the left, which is mechanical drive assemblies, where you have an interlock. Uh, interference fit assemblies, where it's really a friction fit. And then tack in place, which is where you're actually using either a brazing or a welding. So very briefly on the mechanical drive assemblies. I've got these um, lined up here. I would say probably the key way is the most common that people are familiar with. And this is where you're actually relying on mechanical interlock to um, join two cylindrical parts. These can be bearings, bushing, gears. And um, these are arranged so that from the far left where you've got the set screw over to the far right on the spline shaft, they go from essentially the um, lowest torque transmission capability to the highest with the spline on the far right. Um, very common technique for uh, assembling parts. Uh, they definitely have their strengths. Um, what we wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, because with engineers they tend to be always faced with the limitations. And so a couple that we wanted to highlight for mechanical drives then would be the ones that are listed on the left-hand side. So one of them, whenever you have some type of a interlock, uh, you're going to have some type of a stress concentration, which is where this notch effect comes in. And um, this could be where you have a point source which would act to concentrate stress and possibly create a, a failure or require having that area built up stronger to be able to handle the stresses. Uh, the second here, backlash, is probably a very important one, especially keyways and such, where if you have reversing loads, um, you have a little bit of um, space between parts, and that space, when you have um, back and forth motion, can create wear and then ultimately failure. And then an area we're going to talk about on a couple of these has to do with cost. And this is typically this design does require um, extra mechanical components, which increases your cost for each of those components, like the key that you would have involved. And then you also have your machining cost that's associated with creating these. And um, again, it's not a bad thing, but there are opportunities that we're going to present to reduce the uh, cost to achieve results. And then in some cases here, you can have uneven distribution of mass, which as you get into smaller parts, uh, you know, people are trying to eliminate vibration. Yeah, next slide. So that was one type of mechanical class. Second is interference fits. Uh, three most standard are pictured here on the far left is a press fit. Press fit, you know, very simply where you have the shaft has a larger diameter than the bore that you're pressing into, and you're relying on that interference to develop a high degree of friction. Exact opposite um, type of assembly here on the far right with the shrink fit, where you're simply just uh, using either a heated um, hub, which expands, um, and then you put the parts together, cools down, and shrinks into fit, or you freeze the pin or shaft and you get the same type of effect. Put the parts together, they come to room temperature, and they expand. And in the middle, you have the taper fit, which now introduces some additional mechanical components and machining with the nut and the threads. So going to the next slide. Again, talking about, from an engineering perspective, some of the limitations of this. Uh, number one is where you are relying on an interference fit, obviously, 
your tolerances are going to be critical to the consistency of the results that you get. The higher machining tolerance or, or closer machining tolerances um, typically require more operations, could be grinding. Um, those operations all add cost to an assembly. Uh, they all you know, increase the uh, specification for the parts. And again, we'll introduce a concept that uh, kind of takes that out of play a little bit. Uh, the other thing with the interference fit is that all of your stress is really concentrated where the peaks of the metal surfaces interact. Um, so even on a high press fit, you do have some gaps in there between the metal surfaces. They're micro gaps, but those micro gaps um, allow uh, corrosion to occur. You can get fretting, you can get uh, moisture that gets in there, you can get leakage. Uh, that corrosion can be a failure mode. And uh, by its very nature, this very last point here, you are introducing a lot of stress into the components. Sometimes that can limit the types of materials that you can use for putting parts together. And anytime you have a limitation, as an engineer, I think you're always looking for, are there other ways I can take creative use of new materials to assemble them? Okay, and then the last is the tack in place for mechanical assemblies. And this is where you are either welding or brazing to join the two parts. And uh, again, when you do this, you are going to be concentrating the stress in a relatively small area. Matter of fact, I'll go to the next slide. So what are the limitations? Uh, one of the limitations, of course, is you need compatible materials to be able to do welding or brazing. So that does limit, in many cases, your material choice. You now are introducing some very high um, temperatures. They're very localized. They can create uh, stresses or distortion. Obviously, you're not going to easily disassemble anything that's been welded or brazed together. Um, and then this is an area that I've seen um, come into play as far as a, a factor. You need specialized equipment and personnel to do this type of assembly. And Again, we'll try to show an alternative that takes both of these factors out of play so that you don't have the requirements for so much specialized labor. And then um, we'll show an example at the end where uh, when you're doing the welding, obviously you have other operations that are typically required, which is uh, cleaning beforehand and then maybe grinding after the welding. So again, those were the three types of mechanical assembly. The purpose of this presentation was to introduce another alternative and then to explore it in a little bit of depth, and that is retaining compounds. Now, the retaining compounds um, in the photograph to the right, you can see our uh, material that is designed to fill the space between parts. And we're going to talk about two types of space in this presentation. One of them is going to be where the parts still retain some type of an interference fit. Um, or a mechanical fit, and you use the retaining compound in conjunction. The other will be where you are just relying on the retaining compound. Um, the key thing I wanted to mention about the retaining is that um, the type of chemistry that's involved with this material, it's probably worth spending a minute to explain it. Um, this is an anaerobic curing resin. The fundamental characteristic of an anaerobic resin is that it is a one-part material. It uh, cures at room temperature, has a unique characteristic that when you apply it to a part, it uh, covers the surface. It will not cure until it's mated with another metal part. So any material that's between the metal parts will cure once it's contained between the parts because it can no longer get oxygen from the air. It's cut off once the parts are assembled. Uh, the other characteristic that cures an anaerobic material is the actual metallic contact, uh, contact. So you apply the material, you assemble the parts, that cuts off the air to the material, which now uh, makes it conducive to a cure. And then because it's in contact with the metal surface, the actual metal itself um, provides the conditions to make the material cure. And in this case here, the products are engineered to have very high shear strength. 
which is the reason they give you very high strength in these cylindrical parts. They're essentially a structural adhesive uh, designed to fill and distribute the load along the entire surface uh, that's joined. So as I started to mention in the last slide, there's really two ways that they are typically used. And they're used pretty extensively in industry right now. Um, in one way, they're used in addition to a traditional mechanical retaining method. And again, we had talked about three of them, one of them being a mechanical drive. So let's say on a keyway assembly, it is used in conjunction with the keyway. It fills all the empty space between the gear, the shaft, and the key. It cures, and it provides very good um, stress distribution, and it prevents any of the backlash that was originally um, inherent in that design. So one of the limitations that we had also seals that so that you don't get any uh, corrosion or leakage in that joint. Um, if it was an interference fit, like a press fit or a shrink fit, as a matter of fact, uh, on the right-hand side, these graphs do show the type of strength that you would get out of, on this top chart, a shrink fit. And the upper line is if you add a retaining compound to it, you end up getting the strength of the original shrink fit, plus you're now taking advantage of all the inner space between the two components that wasn't mated. You've filled that now with a structural adhesive, it distributes the stresses, provides additional strength, and you get a higher strength joint on a shrink fit. And the same illustration shown on the bottom for a press fit. When you add the material plus the interference fit, you essentially get the benefit of both. Uh, the bottom on here just talks about replacing a mechanical retaining. And this is another common application for the material. We'll show some examples of it at the end, where the material is used instead of a press fit or instead of a mechanical drive. And here they're strictly relying on the retaining compound to provide the strength and distribute the load between the materials. So one thing we showed on the first slide is a design guide, and that is something that will be sent out to all the participants in today's webinar. But um, we have another tool that's available to us through our application engineering group, which is an actual program where you're able to take and input the different key design factors for your joint and the actual type of retaining compound that's used for the joint. And this will do uh, allow you to um, uh, calculate the type of strength that you can get out of it. So uh, on a very rough basis, the retaining compound, as I mentioned, is a structural adhesive. Typically will give you on the order of three to 4,000 PSI shear strength. So joint design factors that come into play then are going to be, as far as input variables, it would be what materials are you bonding together? You're going to get different strengths if you're on steel versus stainless steel versus aluminum. So that is a factor that you can plug into the equation. Another would be the surface finish that you have, um, where you can actually relax the surface finish requirements that you would have for a straight interference fit. For an adhesive, uh, a little rougher surface actually gives you more surface area, better mechanical keying, higher strength. Um, another factor that comes into play is when you're putting parts together, um, you do get um, a factor that comes into play of your length and diameter of your parts. So let's say you're getting 3,000 PSI shear strength. If you have 20 square inches of surface area, it's not simply a multiplicative uh, factor. Um, there's actually curves that this takes into account to um, give you a truer figure as to what your ultimate strength is going to be. And then uh, there are a couple of retaining compound factors that go into play. This would have to do with the operating temperature and maybe the different solvents. Uh, that your material might be operating in. Maybe it's an oil bath or if you have some other type of uh, fluid that it will be exposed to. And of course, the output's going to be the strength rating for the joints that you have. So that's one tool. 
um, that's approximated with the design guide that we send out to you by hard copy. So why do people use it? Two reasons. One is cost, um, and this lists a couple of them, and we've already talked about some of them already. Um, whether you're going to use the material in conjunction with an existing interference fit or mechanical drive, um, you can actually reduce some of your machining operations. In some cases, uh, it's because you are reducing the surface finishing requirements that you have, or you may be re, um, laxing the tolerances on the parts that you're purchasing. It could be that you're eliminating components. You may go from a keyway um, inter, uh, fit, a mechanical drive, to a light press and the adhesive to bond the parts together. Um, to you know, assemble a, a one-inch diameter shaft and a gear with one inch of engagement, you're typically talking on the order of half a cent of material to bond those parts together. So, you know, versus having some mechanical components that are involved, you can see there's an opportunity for some significant savings for components. And there's also the opportunity for savings on the actual machining for uh, the uh, components that are being assembled. So cost is certainly one reason people look at retaining compounds. In many cases, it's cost in conjunction with improvements. Um, or it may just be simply for improvement. So reliability improvements um, is probably one of the big drivers that we see for these materials being incorporated in conjunction with a traditional fit. Um, another reason we, we see people using them is that it allows them to adopt materials that would not join easily together, um, either because of the temperature range that they're going to see and the expansion and contraction differential is a factor for an interference fit where they have, um, oftentimes people are looking to try to go to smaller, lighter assemblies. And by incorporating a structural adhesive as retaining compound, it allows them to reduce the size of the components that they are assembling um, so that the adhesive is providing the strength rather than a, a massive boss around the shaft, which is providing the interference pressure. Um, so that's where you can increase your design options. Uh, let's see, some of the other opportunities to improve reliability is um, eliminating corrosion that can occur. Fretting corrosion could be environmental corrosion because now your joint is sealed. Eliminating some of the stresses that you have when you're trying to do an interference fit or again you have that notch effect and um, again increasing the reliability because you're able to distribute the loads within the joint much better with an adhesive in there which gives you 100% surface to surface contact. Uh, listed on the right hand side, I won't go through those again, those are some of the um, factors that we mentioned that were limitations with traditional mechanical assemblies. All right, so we've covered a little bit about the differences. We've compared and contrasted using a um, retaining compound versus some mechanical assembly methods. We've seen how you can use them in conjunction or you can use it to replace mechanical. How do you actually get them on the parts? So I did include one slide because one thing that I definitely learned in working with customers is uh, they are looking to improve their process, but when they improve their process, they're looking to improve it with some controls. And so I've just shown three very simple types of uh, tools that are available, readily available, used pretty commonly, just make sure people are aware of them. One is a um, simple manual applicator. This screws on the top of a bottle. This has a peristolic hand or a peristolic pump. And every time the operator pulls the trigger, there's actually a stop on the trigger itself that is adjustable. So you can actually control the amount of material that's dispensed per cycle. So it gives you much better precision over the amount of material applied. And um, you can actually put needle tip dispensers on these applicator heads which then allows you to get very precise placement. Um, kind of the next step up from there is a semi-automatic applicator. This here relies on a pressure time dispense cycle. You set the pressure in the reservoir and the amount of time that you have, in this case here, a manual 
um, valve controls the flow of the material and again you can just get better control over where it's applied. Uh, this is a common applicator on automated lines and semi-automated lines and it does not show you the entire um, system here. This is actually hooked up to a reservoir very similar to what's pictured here on the left. The key of this and, a, um, and if you see it in action maybe I can describe it a little bit. This is a rotary spinner and this on the bottom here is actually a customer part but uh, there's a small disc that's at the base of this spinner shaft. This is controlled uh, either by a PLC or a separate timer so this will typically index down into the part. This shaft will start spinning and then this applicator which is mounted adjacent to it dispenses a metered amount of the retaining compound into this cup Obviously, with the cup spinning, the material is dispensed in a precise bead on the ID of this bore. So you get the material exactly where you need it and the precise amount that's required. Then this would index out of the way, and then in this case here, a bearing would be pressed into this um, into this assembly. Actually, we'll see this assembly a little bit later at the end. So that's how to put your parts together and then one um, area that I wanted to just address here is for disassembly these materials again are um, providing you strengths that are comparable to traditional mechanical assembly methods so I guess it's not too surprising you can disassemble parts using the same type of tools you would normally use for doing mechanical uh, interference or, or press fit assemblies um, and obviously there's a range of those that are readily available in the marketplace. Another technique um, that is used is to use these disassembly tools in conjunction with heating the parts. Now the retaining compounds themselves are a thermoset plastic, which means that once they cure, they will not melt again. They do not revert with heat back to a liquid. They remain a, a structural adhesive. So you really need to heat them above their service temperature and for most of the products that would mean taking them up to about 250 degrees C and then while they're hot or very hot in this case you can uh, disassemble them easier. And uh, as we said in the agenda we also wanted to introduce for some of you that might already be familiar with retaining compounds where have there been some improvements and so I'm going to just talk about two types of improvements here. One of them is performance and this is on the actual retaining compounds themselves. Now we use a terminology called primerless oil tolerant higher temperature. But let me just explain what each of those is just a little bit. Um, the anaerobic materials that we're talking about originated as a technology about 60 years ago and the earlier materials were very sensitive to the actual type of metal that they were on. So if it was a plated surface or a stainless steel surface, they would cure slower than if it was a steel or a copper or a brass surface. That has to do with the ionic content of the surface itself. One of the key areas that um, people are familiar with these products um, and have used them for a number of years may be aware that if you're using them on a stainless surface, for example, we would recommend that you would use a secondary step, an actual activator or a primer. You'd apply it to a surface. That would actually provide an activating agent, give you a faster cure with the material. The latest materials that are available essentially have that built into the chemistry of the product itself, and it eliminates the need to have that secondary activator or primer step. Uh, the materials will give you a very good, reliable cure without having to use any secondary primer or activator. Oil tolerant, um, this really is something that we developed because from our customers we found that the cleaning methods that they're using today have changed quite a bit from the past. You know, in the past they were using solvent-based cleaning operations and nowadays they use more environmentally friendly cleaning operations. They don't always clean as thoroughly as the historical solvent cleaners and so the new products that we've developed actually have uh, different resins in them which allow them to cut through uh, machine oil or cutting oil 
or, or cutting fluid or corrosion inhibitor that might be on the surface. So if there's a, a you know bit of that left on the surface, these can cut through and still give you a very high strength uh, bond. So it's more robust in that regard. And then the last characteristic is we found that our customers tend to be going to making their devices smaller and more powerful. And as a result, they're often operating at a higher temperature. So the newest materials um, actually have been improved for their thermal performance. And we'll show a little bit of that. Now these actually have go to the retainer itself as part of the improvement. The other area that we have improved is, um, again, in talking to customers of what they're looking for, many of our customers nowadays are global, where they have a need where they produce something in one region, but it will need to be serviced in another region. And uh, you know, a good example of that would be heavy equipment, which is built perhaps here in the States, but it may be in operation really anywhere in the world. And the engineers who designed it here are looking to ensure that the service people, wherever they are in the world, are able to reassemble the equipment with the same reliability they designed in. So one thing we've gone to is um, products that are available globally so that whatever is designed in one region can be serviced in another region. And uh, with onshoring that's going on now, I guess the good news is you can look at something that might have been designed in another region and needs to be uh, assembled in the U.S. or in Canada, those same products would be readily available. So for temperature, I just wanted to illustrate what I'm referring to. And this is uh, the improvement that we've implemented with our frontline materials. And uh, the dotted lines represent performance of the last generation of the materials. So Let's go to the 180 degree C. So the dotted line here shows that over thousands of hours, the performance would be decreasing. Now these would be products that we would have previously rated to this dotted blue line, which would be 150 C. Um, and now with the improvements that we've made in the thermal performance, we've actually been able to confidently upgrade the thermal rating for them to 180 degrees C or 360 F. So uh, you can see you get um, much better performance out of these same frontline products now with the improvements that we've implemented. The second, I mentioned oil tolerance, and these were three representative categories. So these would be mineral-based oils, cutting oils. Uh, in this case, it's actually an aqueous material, and then some corrosion protective fluids, where, again, comparing the blue and the red lines, this is uh, improvements we've made in the actual resin of the product so that it can cut through the oils. Um, and you see an improvement across the board in their performance. And again, this gives a more robust day in, day out performance. And this test method is um, essentially one that we adopted from the automotive industry. Um, it gives you not a flood of oil. It's more on the order of about 2.5 to 4.5 grams uh, per meter squared, so it's a light film. More typical of parts that uh, may have a little bit of residue on them. And for the primer list, which is eliminating the activator, I'll uh, show you two types of improvements. And again, these are different substrates, and the solid lines represent the current generation, and the dotted lines represent the previous generation, where um, Stainless steel would be what we would consider an inactive surface, something that um, does not have a lot of um, ionic activity to it. And with the new materials, we're seeing higher strength with the materials, even without using an activator. Uh, this would be on aluminum. This would be on stainless. And then the black line here, of course, is with steel. So you're getting higher strength um, here. And this is on the order, of, as I mentioned before, three to 3,000 to 4,500 PSI. And the next set of curves is versus gap. So even with gaps, um, what you're seeing is that these materials are curing very reliably without having to rely on a primer or activator. And I know in the maintenance area, I'll just throw this out even though I don't have the curve um, in the presentation. You know, some people have a... Um, assembly area that may be you know, much colder in the winter or if it's a maintenance area where they're repairing parts outside and they have cold temperatures. We've found the same type of improvement in temperatures that we've tested down to uh, 
negative five degrees uh, centigrade, sorry, five degrees Fahrenheit, a negative 20 degrees centigrade, where these materials will cure very reliably and very quickly, even under cold temperatures. And typically, you know, with chemistries, they tend to be slower at cold temperatures, but the chemists have really done some pretty good work of providing pretty consistent cure um, despite the cold temperature. So just summarizing, I guess on a day-to-day -day basis, products being used and relied upon for a production line, uh, the improvement that we've implemented with the latest is um, don't have to rely on having a secondary priming operation or activator. I uh, don't have to worry about somebody forgetting to do that operation. The materials now can withstand uh, oil or contaminants on the surface and give you consistent strength, so more robust day in, day out performance. And for parts that you're always pushing to higher strength, smaller parts, uh, they have a higher thermal rating. And as I mentioned on the selection criteria for our frontline materials, uh, we have a relatively simple and universal selection guide in our design guide and also in our general catalog, which you answer a couple of questions and it gets you down to one of five different materials that are probably better tailored to that application that you have. And these are the exact same questions that an engineer anywhere in the world would see when they're picking a material. Gives you a better chance of selecting the right product to start with and making sure that the product you've selected is something that's be available if the part has to be assembled or serviced in another region of the world. Okay, so um, let me move on to a couple of applications, and I think with that we will kind of wrap up and move into the questions and answers. So the first application, again, I tried to pick ones that are probably representative of some of the points that we showed in here. This is for a motor assembly where um, the manufacturer was actually looking for a performance improvement, um, went to a retaining compound, and found that uh, they were actually able to reduce their tolerances so that they could go to a slip fit. Um, they did see the cost savings they were looking for, but they actually found they were getting better strength and a much simpler assembly method because they did not need the equipment for the press fit. The operators could simply coat and then slip the parts together, and the material would obviously cure between the metal surfaces and give them higher strength than they were getting when they were doing the press, and they were achieving their other objective of lower cost. So it's not always you get one or the other. In many cases with these, you'll actually get both. Lower cost, better performance. Sorry, just waiting for the slide to change. There we go. Of course, now it goes several at a time. Let's get back there. So the next application I selected, this was really more of a maintenance application, and this is one on a um, axle assembly for uh, heavy-duty buses, where the actual original assembly was not using a retaining compound. You can see the pins here get a lot of corrosion to them. And again, this has to do with a little bit of wear that's allowed because there's a little bit of... Um, a little bit of play in the parts. Um, so they're actually using the retaining compounds in this application when they reassemble the parts. And what they've seen is that the pins, when they're assembled with a retaining compound, are giving them four times the life, which is a very significant savings for them uh, because of the labor and pulling the bus out of service. Um, and one of the keys is that it's preventing corrosion and it's giving a much better stress distribution to the parts. So here they're using it in conjunction with an existing design. Their cost savings are really resulting from the improved performance of the assembly rather than lower cost uh, components to start with. And again, this is a maintenance application and the real world is having some ability to cut through the oil that might be on a part does provide a real uh, performance benefit. Uh, this is an application where the material is really used more for its sealing capability rather than strength enhancement. In this case, um, and I've seen this done actually several ways on heat exchangers where 
the tubes are slip fit into the end sheet and then they're either simply bonded into place or I've also seen them where the tubes are coated, slipped into place and then an expander is run in and expands the tube out and that holds it into place and the retaining compound is relied upon to um, provide the uh, seal and when you have all these different tubes obviously you need high reliability for sealing. Uh, in this case here, this was um, where they were eliminating a brazing repair method, and as we talked about earlier, there was the savings for the equipment, although you know once you bought the equipment, typically people have it. It was really the labor, which was one of the big factors. Um, they now were able to really use uh, in using an adhesive or retaining compound is not a highly skilled task. Operator obviously needs to know how to what the how to apply the material but um, it did allow them to have more operators available to do the, uh, the work in this process. Now we had talked about uh, in mechanical three types, one was a welding or brazing and I thought this was a real good and real simple illustration of the benefit because here where this insert, a threaded insert was attached with brazing, it's not a particularly pretty operation um, this is a galvanized surface, so there's some health and safety issues on the brazing. There's some oil uh, that was on the surfaces. Um, so you also had some pre-cleaning that was required. And this was a situation where the upgraded materials that are now oil tolerant can cut through some of these oils that are present. It was a perfect combination, a nice, simple home run. I mean, this was apply the retaining compound, drop the insert into place, um, in their case, they were actually able to reduce their work in process and the amount of plant uh, floor space that they had uh, for having to process the welding. So very straightforward application, very simple, just another way of approaching it and it uh, provides a lot of benefits to the manufacturer. And the one I'll close on is this uh, prosthetic knee and you actually saw the part earlier when I was showing the automated applicator. This is um, a real high reliability joint where these knees are produced for athletes and for athletes obviously they're going to be pushing this to the maximum for the amount of force and impact that's put on there. Reliability is very critical. Can't afford to have a failure during a competition. Um, these are used for various sports. In this case, uh, this is uh, an athlete that's using it for um, not cross-country skiing, but for uh, snowmobile racing. And so thermal cycling is certainly a factor, and you do also have um, a benefit in the fact that this material seals the joints so you don't get any corrosion uh, on these joints. But the key reason it's used in conjunction with a press fit for these parts is a performance reason. It uh, provides the additional strength that they have by bonding and using the interference fit on these joints. And as we mentioned before, this is an area where the manufacturer also needs to have a very lightweight assembly. So it was a perfect opportunity to go for a lightweight. Um, if we had a close-up picture of these parts, what you'd see is that um, you get dissimilar materials and they're able to reduce the weight simply by not having a massive boss around the bearing location to provide that squeeze. They're able to reduce the amount of metal on the casing and rely on the adhesive to provide the strength. So it really uh, a nice design in on this to provide high performance. And with that, I think we've completed the presentation. Uh, again, we will send out a um, design guide to everybody. And I think we're going to move into the questions and answers at this point. So, I, Miles, I believe you pick it up from here. Yes, uh, yes, I do. So, um, I think uh, I just want to say thank you, Doug, for that uh, for that very uh, informative and uh, incisive um, presentation there. And uh, as you as you said, we'll kick it over to the Q&A now. So uh, I see that uh, we've got uh, a pretty good number of questions coming in here. So uh, uh, we've got about, I guess, about 15 minutes or so for questions. So if there's something that uh, that you'd like to ask, please feel free to, to send it in. And um, 
we will, uh, like I said, I can't promise we'll get to every single question, but we will certainly try to get to uh, as many as we can. So, and also uh, at this time too, I'll let uh, Doug, I'll let you and Rob kind of figure out who wants to tackle each question here. I guess. All right, sure. But, um, <clears throat> we can start with uh, start with one up here. Um, so this was uh, okay. Well, so this was a question about how do you disassemble Loctited parts for replacement? Oh, okay. Um, so two methods. I mean, one of them is the materials do tend to provide the type of strength that you see in a actual mechanical assembly. If it was an interference, but I, maybe I'll be a little more specific. It's more in line of what you'd get for an interference fit on a part. So a bearing puller. Or um, another method that I've seen that's used for disassembly on some large parts is where they actually use hydraulic pressure, where they'll even feed it through the shaft with the hydraulic pressure, and then that will actually expand the um, bearing, for example, and it will almost pop right off of the end of the, the tapered shaft. But uh, traditional uh, bearing puller techniques that you would use for taking out an interference fit will work. Um, the other technique that's used is to combine that with heating the parts up, maybe with a torch, to get them up to about 250C. Okay. All right. Uh, go on to a different question here then. Um, so this one, uh, person wants to know, do you have a recommended... Um, assembly procedure when applying Loctite between a shaft, shaft slash bearing to ensure that the gap taken up by the Loctite is consistent so the bearing is concentric to the shaft. Okay, so this would be a situation where you have a clearance between them. So, for example, we would recommend up to a 3,000s or well, 3,000 is typically what we recommend for a clearance on parts if you're not going to be using a press fit. That's a um, a, a good size gap so that you can actually get a good film of material in there. And as far as ensuring alignment on there, I've actually seen it used to provide uh, very precise alignment where they have a fixture or a jig that will um, hold the parts concentric for the several minutes while the material will initially set. And then they can take the parts out of the fixture and jig and move them along. And so it would be fixturing that would typically be used to provide a concentric fit. The other way to do it is to go to a line to line fit. So the parts, the bearing and the shaft would uh, just be a very light slip fit or a very light press fit, I guess would be the better term to use. And then you would apply the retaining compound to the components. You'd use a light press fit to put them together and that would provide the alignment that you're looking for and the material when it cures provides the strength. So those are the two methods. One is okay. light press fit in conjunction with a retaining mm -hmm. compound or a slip fit with some type of fixturing. Okay. Um, there also, uh, is this also in, in, uh, in that guide that you mentioned as well or, or no, not? I don't, I don't think that is covered in that guide. Okay. Um, and as a matter of fact, if there's any questions that come in after this, Mm -hmm. uh, we'll certainly go through them. So you've got my email showing right on the screen. By all means, right. you know, please contact us directly if you need more information. Right, right. Okay. All right, good. Uh, moving on then with some more questions here. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's a question. Uh, what, is the, uh, what is the minimum bonding thickness to achieve maximum shear strength? Uh, minimum minimum would, bonding thickness. Yeah, there. Okay, so for minimum, it's actually used in conjunction with press fit. So I think it comes down more to your design objectives that you have. Mm -hmm. um, because if you were to use it in conjunction with a press fit, you get an additive effect of press fit plus the retaining compound. So that would be one way you would use it. Um, there, we typically would say if you wanted to increase your strength, you, you would adjust your surface finish. Your surface finish um, of a press fit then would allow more mechanical keying with the adhesive. And within the design guide, they do have uh, charts that show strength effect with surface finish. So that would be one way to do it. The other is um, if you go strictly to a clearance 
fit, then uh, I think as I was showing in the presentation itself, uh, we you'll see very good strength through about uh, 0.25 millimeter, mm -hmm. and we would recommend staying within that. Uh, typically, uh, three to six thousandths is uh, optimum range if you're on a slip fit. Okay. All right. So switching gears slightly here, I think uh, this is a little bit about uh, temperatures. Uh, there was some uh, there was some talk uh, earlier about uh, um, about kind of upper level or, or, or upper end temperatures. So this one uh, this one asks a question about uh, are the operating or post cure temperatures also uh, extended to colder temperatures? So the the figures are given here are minus 30 or minus 40 degrees C, let's say. Somewhere down in that in that region. So, okay. So for the operating, yeah, usually it's the higher limit. I mean, what we have is a negative 65 Fahrenheit or negative 54 C is the uh, lower range that okay. we have on there. I don't know if this is an area where you know somebody's looking for performance below that. I think we've got some data we've generated for specific customers in you know very cold temperature applications. Mm -hmm. If that's an area this particular person's interested, I would recommend they contact us and we could explore that part. But um, you know, typical rate, standard rating for the material in cold is uh, negative 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. All right. Uh, here's another. Uh, here's another question here. Uh, and this sounds like it's a. Uh, it's a question about a uh, application that this person has. It says we have a uh, aluminum to aluminum shrink fit. There is grease used to prevent galling during uh, assembly. We are having audible creaking problems in use. Uh, does the retaining compound reduce the uh, galling? I'm not galling. Galling. galling yeah. Effect, sorry. Uh, can it be used in conjunction with grease? The other other part of that. Actually, well, you know, we were talking about some front line products here in general. Mm -hmm. And this particular request is a little unique, and we actually do have a material that's designed for providing lubrication during assembly. Um, it was actually pioneered for very heavy press fits on things like the wheels that go on a train, where yeah. this person's experiencing some galling. And yes, we do have actually some specialized products listed in our catalog for exactly this type of application where they provide the lubrication during the assembly process. That might be something they would be interested in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, give a product designation of 232 if they want to jot that down, they can contact us. But mm -hmm. uh, no, we have a lot of specialty grades of materials. That would be one that uh, sounds like it would be appropriate here. We would recommend using it instead of the grease. If you do put a, the grease on that's not going to be compatible with the retaining compound. It'll work at odds with giving you the strength after assembly. Okay. So that's where you'd want to use a product that actually provides that lubrication during assembly. And, and we have uh, some other materials as well that uh, I know are used on some aluminum applications um, where they've been the only thing that's you know, provided the lubrication so these parts can be put together. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, Move on here to uh, uh, a few more questions here. Okay. Uh, are all compounds the same joint strength? For slighter parts that need uh, occasional replacement, the ability to break the seal without a big press would be required to replace set screws. Is there something in that range? That is a great question. I'm glad somebody asked that. Um, you know what? I, I think one thing we always get fixated on is stronger, stronger, stronger. But actually, if you were to look at that decision tree that I had shown a little bit earlier in the presentation, we have recognized that people don't always need the highest strength. And we mm -hmm. do have some medium strength and even lower strength products um, where you can actually tailor it to the amount of strength that you need for your assembly. So yes, we, we do a great job of making high strength. The good news is we actually have the range and we do have standard products globally available that are lower strength as well. And um, that'd probably be one where maybe we, you know, get in contact after um, mm -hmm. if somebody wants to get into that more specifically. But right on the decision tree that's in that design guide they would receive, it mm -hmm. will speak to that and provide a product recommendation for a medium strength material. Okay. 
<clears throat> yeah, certainly. We're uh, uh, we're bumping up here almost close to three o'clock, but uh, we've uh, we've got time for for a few more questions here. We'll see how many of these we can actually get through. Okay. Uh, but uh, so here's another one. Uh, what is the maximum temperature that uh, that the joint can see, and uh, can the compound be used with the copper to copper joint? Uh, it can be used on a copper to copper joint, but because that material is so active, and when we say active, we mean it has uh, such a high ionic content, ion, active ion content, it, it causes a material to cure. We actually do have um, some grades of material that are recommended for copper surfaces. Um, and typically that's so that you have enough time to get your parts fully assembled and seated. So okay. that's part of the answer, and there was another part of that question, like what was the... Uh, the maximum uh, maximum temperature that the joints oh, maximum can maximum temperature. Can see? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, the, when we do temperature ratings, we typically are doing for long term, mm -hmm. and that might be a little different than like a short term exposure. Um, so I'm going to go by long term because that's where we generate most of our data. Uh, okay. The products I was talking about in the presentation today were 360. We do have other products that are rated for um, 450 Fahrenheit as a operating temperature and they would even see some spikes above that okay all right um, this is a, a question that kind of follows along those similar lines but uh, is there uh, is there a standard or general guideline for determining what the uh, appropriate interference is for dissimilar metals in a press fit application in a press fit application hmm, I think Rob I'm gonna Call a friend on this one. Maybe you could. So Rob's our technical uh, manager, and if your line is active, maybe you can speak more specifically to. Yes, I'm active here. Uh, can you just repeat, Sean? I got them all lit up here. I want to make sure I address the correct one. Oh sure, yeah. Uh, it's uh, it says, is there a standard or general guideline for determining what the uh, uh, appropriate interference is for dissimilar metals in a press fit application? Uh, yeah, it, it will be specific for the individual application. Typically, bearings are made out of steel, um, where you tend to get challenges when you have like an aluminum housing. So what will tend to happen is the housing will expand as the assembly gets hot, and then potentially your press fit will drop away. And so you need to design it for taking into account the linear shrinkage so that when it's at its operating temperature that it still has some compression and that'll determine how much initial press fit you have to put it together. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, and then maybe maybe we've got time for maybe one more question, I think, here. Um, so this one uh, is a question about Loctite 680. Is Loctite 680 now a, a primerless system for stainless steels? Uh, yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, and that actually uh, will be listed in the design guide as um, that it's a product that's actually just being upgraded to that uh, primerless capability. Okay. And and the actual part numbers and all are listed right in the ca in the uh, design guide. Okay. All right. All right. That's so, good. Um, so yeah, let me. Uh, since we're I guess the question is, if we if we had questions we didn't get to, will those be forwarded to us so that we're able to respond to them, Miles? Uh, I believe so. Uh, I believe that 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 uh, that we can certainly do that. And also, I mean, um, you know, if not, maybe if I could just reference this this slide, this last slide that's actually up there, mm -hmm. uh, where we do have everyone's contact info. You've got my contact info there, but. Uh, uh, you know, there's also there Doug and, and Rob. Your contact info is on there uh, as well. There's there's uh, the uh, email, and also this will you know, since everybody will keep uh, will get a copy of this of this webinar. Uh, you will have access to uh, to all of this contact info uh, too. So, if there's some follow-up question that someone would like to send uh, directly to you know either uh, yourself, Doug, or Rob. Uh, they can certainly, you know, they can certainly do that that Good. way too. So, yeah, we so want to make sure keep we keep the conversation going too. Right. Yeah. Good. Okay. All right. Well, uh, so again, I want to thank both uh, you, Doug, and Rob. Um, just as a kind of wrap up there, uh, uh, I've said this before, but I'll say it once here again. So this webinar, uh, you will be able to find it at designworldonline.com. 
Uh, and also, uh, everybody who's registered for this webinar will get a copy of it via email as well. Um, and if you still like to, to tweet about this at all, you can do so at hashtag DWWebinar. Uh, if you want to connect with uh, us fine folks here at Design World, you can do it through various, various methods there via Facebook, Twitter, Google+, LinkedIn, Pinterest, or YouTube. We're on, we're on all of those uh, channels. And we can also uh, keep this uh, discussion going over at engineeringexchange.com. Uh, and obviously, if you have any direct questions for either Doug or Rob, you can also send those uh, to them as well. And I'm sure they will be glad to, to answer any questions that you have. So uh, once again, I'd like to thank both uh, yourself, Doug, and Rob uh, for your time today and for your um, expertise. And thank everybody out there who joined us today on the webinar as well. And uh, with that, I wish everyone a good rest of the day and a good rest of the week here, too. All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, guys.